and then I got to restart it so it's not the same address, all that stuff. It just messes everything up. So it's really nice to have you, Vanessa, um, Andre. Uh, anything interesting going on? Any prayer needs? Anything? Uh, everything's going good. So going good. So. Cool. Um, Andre, you see that new guy, Abraham? Uh, I don't even remember what his last name is, but the guy who was um, the really good answers to um, his belief as far as how Jesus is and all that stuff. Did you? Okay, give me one second. No, fix that. Okay, so I guess we'll, <clears throat> I'll try to get this connected. Um, it should take care of the internet problem, hopefully. If not, then I, there's nothing I can do about it. Okay, <clears throat> so here we go here. You can still hear me, right? Okay. So last week we talked about um, the Memra, and we're teaching about the Memra as far as what it is um, in Jewish understanding. So if you look up Pedia, Memra, M-E-R-M-A, you see that the Jews had an idea of an agent or a person who was for God, doing things for God. And it'll give you a list of the Old Testament, I'm sorry, not the Old Testament, but the, um, the rabbis and how they wrote about it and all that other stuff. So then there's another book called Heaven. And it's written by a Jewish man. And he started to write about how the Jews had this Heresy is what he's calling it, and it is about this second power in heaven. So there's God, and then there's a second power that God is using to operate through. I really suggest um, you guys read it. He's obviously not a Christian, so he doesn't like the Christians. And so he talks about how he's trying to figure out what, um, what group the Jews were kind of contesting with and trying to figure out who was what was wrong with them and who were they infiltrate the Jews. He's trying to figure this out. And he has a couple of ideas. He thinks it's probably the Gnostics um, or it could be the Christians, Jewish people who had the wrong understanding. And he goes through and shows how certain teachers, certain rabbis, certain important Jewish had this idea of a second power. And so we're going to look at some of that today. <clears throat> and um, so we had this Bible study, one of my first Bible studies, we talked about this stuff, but I went through it so fast. I want to rehash it and look at it. So the first verse we're going to look at is Genesis chapter 19, verse 24. And in Genesis 24, uh, 19, 24, it says, Then Yahweh... And in that place it says, so then Yahweh reigned upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, 
brimstone and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. So the name of Yahweh is there twice. <clears throat> and that's very significant because, open up my, uh, my paper here. So, so here we see an example of the Bible using the name of God twice, and it is being referred to two separate persons in two different locations. Jesus was given the name above all names. And whose name is the name above all names? Um, the only name that is above all names is the name of God. And so what we must understand here is that the Bible is talking about was given the name reigning fire and brimstone from God who is in heaven. So if we look at that verse very quick, uh, very clearly, using the name twice, and I guess in proper English when we talk about ourselves or we talk about one person, you don't say Vanessa a car and drove and drove Vanessa tour with it. It doesn't make sense because you're going to use the name twice. You use a pronoun of that person so that you know you're not talking about another person named Vanessa. So it's not just one Vanessa there. It's Vanessa drove Vanessa to somewheres. So you have to understand the way this sentence is. Then Yahweh rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah fire from. So he's saying from Yahweh, one Yahweh is throwing fire and brimstone from another Yahweh. And so the best way to understand this is that Jesus is the image of God and he is the representative of God and he is the Shalia of God or the Memra of God. And that understanding gives you the reason why his name is also Yahweh because he's a, the representative, the full representative of God. It's, then it starts to get a little confusing as far as the rest of the New Testament because it talks about when Yahweh does this or when Yahweh does that or when God does this or God does that. You have to realize that it could be Jesus in that place. People wonder, there's a bunch of verses that talk about God where he you know, is offered up as a sacrifice and this kind of stuff uh, where it says he he's going to, you know, uh, where they broke my, you know, where they pierced my hands and my feet, and it's saying they're saying that it's God who did that, but we know that God didn't do that. Jesus said, Jesus was the one who was saying these things because no one was seeing God directly. So it's going to make the rest of the, New, the Old Testament more ambiguous, and we have to look more, uh, more closely at who is being speaking and who's not. But... Um, so the only name that is above all names is the name of God. Now, if you look in the Hebrew, the word that is God's name is used twice in a sentence. This is another example of how the sentence seems to be talking about another person, but upon more further detail and examination, you find out that there's actually two beings spoken of here, one on earth and one in heaven. So I already talked to you about how in the last video that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation and that the word of, the word of the Lord is mentioned uh, which is in the commentary for the Bibles, which is the Targum, which we look at. If we look at the Targum, so now, now we're going to look at the Targum from uh, the Jewish understanding of what this verse is saying. So from the Bible says, Yahweh, another Yahweh. In the Targum, which is the commentary that they use to understand the word, it says, and the word of the Lord himself, had made to descend upon the people of Sodom and Amorah. So he tried to, it's it's kind of saying that he, the word of the Lord, which is obviously the word of God, which is Jesus, came down and tried to win them over. And they, that they might repent, might work repentance from their wicked works. But when they saw that the showers of favor, when they saw that the word of God was being favorable to them and trying to get them to repent, our wicked works are not mass, mass, uh, manifest before him. He turned in and caused to descend the fire and the brimstone, the Lord from the heavens. So the commentary is saying that the word of the Lord came, tried to bring repentance. They absolutely refused, and so he brought down the fire and the brimstone. 
the interpretation of the Jews of what's being said here because they know that there is some unusual comment being made here in the Hebrew where one Yahweh is bringing something from another Yahweh. So, uh, so, we, so as we examine the Jewish theology here, we see that the commentary, which is the, which is the Targum, is what the word of the Lord was, is that the, Lord of, the word of the Lord was there and not God Almighty. In this verse, when we're looking at this chapter, it starts off with Abraham just getting circumcised, uh, outside of his tent, and he is um, trying to fix his, uh, I mean, just waiting for healing on his circumcision. And it says that three men came to him. In the, uh, in the beginning, it says that three men came to him, and that he went out to meet them, and all this and that. Well, it says that one of them is the Lord, and that he's talking to the Lord face to face, essentially. The other two are angels, and we'll find out later. But at the beginning of the how Lord, the how he met him, and he was saying stuff. And one of the three said, "Hey, by this time next year, you're going to have Isaac. I return to you, and I'm going to uh, you know talk to you about some stuff when she has Isaac." So. If it's three messengers or three angels or whatever they want to believe for that, this person is saying, I'm going to come back when, um, when Sarah has a child and I'm going to visit you. And if you look at the story when God does appear to Abraham after Isaac is born, when um, they're fighting over the, the, some sort of fruit or something or Ishmael is being mean to Isaac, and Sarah's like, get him out of here. Get the whole, get her, Hagar, get Isaac, uh, Ishmael, get him out of here, because they're not going to have that my son's going to have. And she pretty much kicks him out. Um, and Abraham's like, you do what you want to do. But then God comes, the Bible says, and he says, do what Sarah's telling you. Go ahead and let her out. Go ahead and send him away. I'll take care of him. So... It's interesting how the in the beginning of the chapter, and we should look at that probably just to get a better idea of what we're what we're studying, because this is all intertwined here. So Genesis chapter one, verse nineteen, just to get an understanding of the entire verse here. Um, oh no, I'm sorry, eighteen it should go to eighteen. So it says that it appeared unto him by the oaks in Mamre, which is Genesis eighteen, verse one. So it says that the Lord appeared to him as he sat at the tent of the door in the heat of the day. He had just got circumcised, old man. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood towards over and against him. So in this verse, it says that the Lord, which is Yahweh, that Yahweh showed up. And then it starts in verse 2 to start talking about the story about how Yahweh came and visited him. And it says that three men showed up before him in verse 2. But you will not call God Almighty a man. Absolutely wrong. You don't call God Almighty a man. So what Yahweh is he talking about? Or what Yahweh are we talking about? So it says, then he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, uh, three men stood over against him. And when he saw them, he ran over to him. So it says... Verse 3 says, my Lord, if now I have found favor. So he's talking about Lord. It's not the, the word Yahweh there in verse 3. It's he's saying my Lord. Um, so he's talking to this person. Uh, let's see where it talks about Yahweh. So in verse four, 13 it says, and Yahweh said unto Abraham. So now he's talking to, he, originally the story starts that he's talking to three men. First of all, it says the, that Yahweh came to visit him, and then he says he's talking to three men, and then it says Yahweh said to him while he's talking to them. It's so unusual because then two of the men leave, and one stays, and it says Yahweh is still talking to him, and he starts asking about whether or not there's 50 or whether there's 30, or you know, are you going to destroy it for 10 and all of that. 
to see that it's absolutely an unusual commentary or an unusual story because he's talking to a man, but they're saying that Yahweh is pretty much standing there. Then you have to think about John chapter 1, verse 18. It's always go to because it says no one has ever seen God ever, but that it was Jesus. So now you're starting to see that it's Jesus who's named Yahweh, who's on earth in Genesis chapter uh, 18, who he's talking to. So who's he talking to? He's talking to Jesus. He's not talking to God the Father. God the Father's not standing there. Um, uh, and we, the story of where the white throne judgment is in Revelations. And um, we can go look at that real quick. Interesting about the white throne judgment. I think that's in chapter 20, 19, maybe, I think. Let's see here. So in verse, in chapter, in Revelations chapter 20, so in chapter 20, verse 11, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. The throne appears, which is obviously the throne of God, and him that sat upon it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. So the earth and the heaven could not stand in the presence of the throne there. God being on there, even more, they can't stand there. So what, what we're learning is that if God were on earth, right? I mean, if God was on earth when Abraham was there, the heavens wouldn't even exist. It wouldn't be able to stand. It would be burned away. If you look about the story, I think it's in, um, it talks about how the, or maybe it's in Peter, where it talks about that heaven and earth will burn away. They'll be burned with fervent heat. And it talks about once more, um, God will shake everything. When God, if God were to be seen, we wouldn't be able to stand in his presence. I mean, you think about when the prophets see, um, you know, what, God's or God's glory is right there before them. They fall down as dead, just with His presence being there. Um, that's not seeing Him. Just knowing that it's just God revealing Himself being there makes them fall down as dead. And when God's throne shows up in Revelations, you see that the heavens and the earth. There's no place found for them, and that means that means nowhere's since is the heavens and earth have a place for them because of the white throne. That means they stop existing altogether in the presence of God is. That's how awesome it is. But So it's not God standing here talking to Abraham. It's not. It's Jesus because Jesus is what? The image of God, the uh, representative. So when you see Jesus, you're seeing what God has given you to see his presence, to see the presence of God. When he says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because ever be able to see of God is what Jesus represents, is what who Jesus is, is his representation. So, and what we're, and the ultimate thing that I'm trying to show right now is that the Jewish understanding, and and if you look at the model, it's not God in a trinity, but it is God and his son operating. Because if it is God, the same rule applies. The whole thing would be gone. You would not be able to survive. We would not be able to survive. The earth wouldn't be able to, to, stay, to stay there. So to protect us from being burned away, he uses his son to op operate, to talk to us, to do all that. So we examine um, the Jewish theology and we see that. It's, it's identical to Arianism because Arianism believes that Jesus is the word of God 
and that he is that he is doing the revealing of God on the earth. And that's exactly what Genesis uh, John chapter one verse eighteen says. No one has ever in the past no one has ever seen God, the only begotten or born God, who is Jesus. He was revealing him in the revealing him in the Old Testament. Um, so we talked about that already. So that is not, uh, in the old Testament, that's the Jewish understanding. And we see where they're getting that. If you watch the last video, how, uh, it talks about in Genesis chapter three, that in Genesis chapter three, how it says, and the voice of the Lord God walked in the cool of the day, or walked in the garden, and they heard it. Adam and Eve heard the 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 voice of God walking. Voices walking in the garden. Why does the Bible say it that way? That they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. You don't hear voices walking in the cool of the day. It's just it's just an interesting way of them to say. Jesus, the word of God was walking in the cool of the day. So I'm going to read you the, the I'm going to quote you something from the book of uh, Two Powers in Heaven. This is the Jewish man who's trying to understand and, and explain away why there was a, a belief system in the Jewish understanding of two powers where God was his God and that he was operating through someone else. And this is going to give us an understanding of why John talks about the word. It's not something new. It's something old. It's something very old. It's an old Jewish understanding about the word. In John chapter 1, verse 1, um, and 18, and uh, many other places. So, in Two Powers in Heaven, page 119 and 120, it says, This passage is very important, and we're talking about the one the verse that we're talking about right now the verse that we're talking about is um genesis chapter 19 verse 24 i believe it was so in the passage it says this passage is very important because uh is an important piece of evidence because we have external evidence that shows genesis 119 genesis 1924 was used by contemporary Ismael bin Yossi. So this rabbi, ancient rabbi, back in 200, uh, probably a little bit after Jesus died and the temple had been destroyed, this um, rabbi had had said this uh, to show that two divine figures ruled the universe. So if you see that, you're seeing that. Um, that our Ishmael ben Yossi, who was a Jewish teacher, used this verse to show that there are two powers in heaven. Now that's very curious because you we don't know that. Um, we're not taught that, but it's not the Trinity. It's not the Trinity. It's two powers. It's two important beings being used. God obviously being in existence and another power, another agent of an agent of God using uh, or being used by God. So if you read that, that this guy, um, Rabbi Ishmael Ben Yossi, used the verse for that reason. Then we look at it says uh, two divine figures to rule the universe. Then it says Justin Martyr, nineteen twenty four, to prove that Christ operated as an agent in Sodom and against uh, Gomorrah. He is God's messenger in the world of man. This is remarkably firm proof that even Orthodox Christians were seen to use or to seen as two powers heretics. Anybody who believes that God is God and God is using um, someone else, they call that two powers heretics. So this is remarkably firm proof that even Orthodox Christians were seen as two powers heretics. Many two powers traditions, ostensibly, uh, ostensibly from the Tanaim uh, and the Amoraic time periods, 
uh, in their present form. The problem has been any aspect of the tradition could have existed during the Tanaitic period. Because of that, much of the ostensibly uh, Tanaitic evidence has turned out to be dated only to a later period and has necessarily been surveyed. Now we can turn the meaning of Amoraic evidence, of course, any heretical argument first attested by the rabbis, the Amoraic period, and these are time periods that I'm I'm reading about. So I'll show you what this what this means. They're saying that they're hearing rabbis trying to refute or debate or argue against or teach against this lie of a two powers doctrine, because during and and the, so the the Tanaim period is from zero, which is Jesus' birth, to around 200, fight against some teaching in Jewish circles of a second power in heaven. So, obviously, this is during the time of Christ. You know, during zero to 200 uh, CE or AD, Jesus has just died at 33 AD, and then after that, you have the church growing to begin with. And they were having to, they had to, to try to deal with the development of Christianity inside of Judaism, because that's where we started from. It, it was all Jewish. And so once they started seeing the development of Judaism, uh, of Christianity within Judaism, and they started hearing Jews saying, the word of the Lord is Jesus, and that Jesus came to earth, and you killed him, and now we are saved through his death. If, what do we do now? Because they're using our scriptures. They're using the, the Targum and our belief in the word of the Lord against us now. Looking at it, they're saying, look at their Apostle John. Their Apostle John is saying that Jesus is the word, that Jesus, the word became Jesus. And in our understanding, the Jews are saying, that's the person who was at the beginning with God, teaching, uh, operating, doing all of these things for God. And as are, in their opinion, they're saying that we're hijacking their understanding and using it and manipulating it to get people to follow Jesus. But in an actuality, it is Jesus. But what they started to do, once they started to have to deal with Growing up within Judaism and using the belief system of Judaism, they started to cut those books out. They stopped using the Targums after that because Christianity now, it used to support Jewish understanding, but now it supports Christianity because of the Lord supposedly. So anytime they bring up the Memra, anytime they bring up who the word of the Lord is in the Targum, somebody's going to say, that's Jesus causes chaos. So that's what's happening. They're seeing the development of these arguments starting at from z between 0 and 200. They're starting to have these issues. And between 200 and uh, 450 a uh, AD, they're trying to teach against it and trying to, and cutting books out of their doctrine. The book of Enoch talks about Jesus and salvation through Jesus. Lives. And it's a really good book to teach Jesus. But they cut it, absolutely cut it out because it was just too much. They couldn't refute the proof that Jesus was the word, understand as the word of the Lord in these verses. So as we look at this timeline, and I have it right here, you can't see it, but as we look at this timeline, um, we see that uh, that the time between Jesus' birth and 200 CE is the time that uh, claims the second power being used, the teaching of the second power. Now, actually, the second power teachings go way before Jesus. Debate about whether it's true or not around this time period. So it's very interesting that in the same time that Christianity was developing, and the reason you start seeing these apologetics against the view is because it's Christianity developed within uh, Judaism. That is why you see the opinion of the rabbis changing, and they no longer want to use the Targums because the Christians have painted it with the idea of Christ. 
but it is um, was already originally believed. So <clears throat> let me. Um, so I want to get back to where I was at. So questions at this at this moment about what's being taught and why or the 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 problems with or the things that you're dealing with on this we move on just a little further this is not an easy topic to um to have so is there is there a or anything that you're asking or wondering about in this um no i'm just just listening Learning. Okay. Learning. all right just checking um so okay so we're gonna move on then got a couple of uh, places in the bible which are very interesting genesis chapter 20 verse 13 so we're going to we're going to keep moving on in this understanding about yeah. lord and where jesus is in the old testament can can we start back at where you were talking about the book of enoch well the book of enoch has yeah the book of enoch has a lot of references to how he is um ancient of days so if we look at daniel story of where um the son of the son of man uh, appears with the ancient of days who's the ancient of days obviously is the father and is, um is jesus and it talks about just how he's uh who jesus is and how he's going to come and and take over you know authority from god and 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 not take it away from him but operate as a king under him really got to read the book of enoch to check it out there are problems with the book of enoch which is why it's not in the in the um in the canon as far as an accepted book um that i've heard from other people that sound like a good enough argument to me um, use the book of enoch and I have other people who study the book of Enoch and absolutely accept it as um, interesting things about the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is mentioned. Jude. Um, so it's quoted in the book of Jude. It is quoted in the, in, in a lot of the early church fathers used the book of Enoch with no problem. The Septuagint, which is the Bible that they had before the new Testament ever existed. There had the book of uh had the apocrypha with it and um so it's a it's a known writing but it talks about jesus a lot in there the perspective if anything we can use the book to see how they envisioned the messiah whether he was going to be god himself or whether he's going to be a different person um, i would not use the book of enoch for bible just because it's 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 there's so much to, to study in that it has like a hundred and something chapters i can't remember how how many it's got in there but it's but it's it's interesting how the jewish and i'm only using that to see how the jews understood the messiah and who he would be it lines up a lot of it lines up with what we know of jesus now um so the book of enoch is an interesting read it talks a lot about um, the angels that married women in John uh, in Genesis chapter nine, I believe, or six maybe, where the angels went and saw women and thought they were absolutely beautiful and started taking them as wives and having sex with them and having babies. That's in the Bible, okay? So when you look at Enoch, it starts off with angels actually went down and did that and you start reading about what angels they were and the punishments they got and all of that and how they showed women how to use makeup and how to look more beautiful and all that stuff taught all the, those arts and those and things like that it's it's an interesting read 
the problems, I think what somebody brought up is that they were already using metals before the angels came down and did that. So add up in that area, unless they're saying they made, they taught them how to use metals way better than they were using them before, which would clear that whole situation up. But I've heard arguments about not using it, but it's interesting to, to just to note what it says and, uh, and see what the Jewish idea of the, of the Messiah was, because it talks about the Messiah a lot. Um, so <clears throat> that's the reason I brought it up is just so we know what the understanding is. Understanding. So, oh, uh, um, so the, the verse that we're talking about here is Genesis chapter 20, verse 13. Says, it's very interesting. And I'm not teaching, I'm teaching Arianism here, which is the same thing as what Judaism has been teaching before. They decided they're not going to start teaching that because we're using it for Christian purposes. Verse 13 of chapter 20 in Genesis says, When Elohim right, caused, caused me to wander from my father's house. Okay. This is Abraham. Let me make sure I'm doing this right. So Genesis chapter 20, verse 13. Genesis chapter 20. It says, And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said, This is thy kindness which thou, hast, thou, thou shalt show unto me, And so it's Abraham talking. It's Abraham talking. Just wanted to make sure that it was Abraham. So he's talking about when God told him to leave the where he was living. Statement here. When Elohim, which is God's in plural, and it doesn't usually usually Elohim means only one person. Elohim was used for Moses. He was called a god in um, Exodus chapter 4 and Exodus 7, 1. They call him a god, or in the stead of God, or instead of God, or in the place of God. It says Elohim. About one Moses. Only four, one. But sometimes it can mean two, depending on the sentence structure. And so this is what we, we need to look at. It says, when Elohim's, Read it when God's caused, and the word caused there is plural. So it says, when God's, they caused me to wander from my father's house. Caused there is plural, because you can add a plural, add plurality to that, to, to an action. So if there's an action verb, like we say run, they have something that they can attach to their verbs to say they ran instead of one person ran. ran run. Uh, if we say run, that's one person ran. We have to add that to show plurality. For them, they can just attach something to their word, and it makes it a plural action, a plural verb. So when you read the sentence, then it tells you that the sentence is not saying two gods because the action is plural that someone is doing two people are doing it at least two people are doing the action so it says when gods caused me when they caused me you would it's not wrong to say they caused me because it is plural the trinitarians don't want to say caused is a plural as far as making it two different beings because the two are one or the three are one. So you wouldn't want to use plural. You want to always use the singular of the verb, meaning that only one did it. So when you're reading this, it does say, if you look at the Hebrew words um, to, to define that, Blue Letter Bible is really good for that. Um, BlueLetterBible.com is, is perfect because you can click on the verse. It'll show you the, the different... Hebrew, you can click on it and see what it means. And 
tells you the tenses and all that stuff. So in this verse, it's very curious that it's saying that there are two Elohim. It means mighty ones. It doesn't mean, it's not the name of God. It doesn't mean anything more than mighty ones or, you know, powerful ones. So it's when the powerful ones, they caused me to wander from my father's house. Wonder if they let the Bible stay like that. If you if they read if they translated the Bible like that, you would see what kind of confusion like that. And so that's why they didn't use it because it's confusing. Um, so, <clears throat> but it is there in the Hebrew, and it's something to to consider because ism is is that God is God and Jesus is the Son of God. And he is his representative. So that's two different individuals, not a three in one God, but one God and one Son of God that's operating. You read this verse in Arianism and in Judaism back then, they understood it's God and the word of the Lord for Jews. That's what they believed. That's God and the word of the Lord. Christianity, that's God. And Jesus, who is the word of God. It's so similar. But that's what Arianism believes. And that's what Judaism believes. And that's what they have believed for so long. 200 AD to 400 AD, they started pushing that stuff away because Christianity was claiming that for themselves. So interesting and very <clears throat> unusual. Not, not something normal the church to, to have to admit that they, there was two Elohims there and that both of them, plural, did an action, did an action, not one. So just that verbiage shows that they're not one, but two individuals. To Genesis chapter three, verse 21, I believe, where it says that man has become like one of us. One of us means that there are at least two numerically. Because if, if I'm a one and I'm, I'm with you, Vanessa, and I say, so and so has become like one of us, it doesn't mean that we are one. It means I'm a person and I'm a one and you're a one when we say one of us. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, I think it is, or 22, Man has become like one of us. So numerically, it's not a trinity because the trinity model says they're three in one. But if he says one of us, it means one or the other. It's numerically different in the model when, you, when they say that. And obviously, we know what happens in Genesis chapter one where they say, let us make man in our image, our likeness. And then they later on say one of us, meaning one, you number one or me a one. And then you see this one where it says, God's caused, they caused me to wander from my house, from my father's house. That's plural, plural, plural subject, plural action, verb, and, and the, the rest of the sentence. So you're seeing how they're talking about something different than what's being taught normally. Um, okay, so we have eight minutes or seven minutes, and I don't want to yet. Um, but obviously we have more. I've written down every verse that I can think of that has something unusual like this, and that's what we're going through because I want to teach you guys what's happening, what's the, what's the word saying, and hopefully giving you something about, um, about Jesus and about the word, about Arianism, about Trinitarianism, and Unitarianism and the, and the lie in that area. Um, if um, if you don't have any more questions, then we can close it because I I don't want to go too long. I could I could probably go all day and, and probably bore a lot of people to death. <laughs> but um, it looks like everybody else dropped off because the connection was bad, and I'll try to fix that next week. But um, no. we'll see. I, I love it. I, I love it. Thank you so much for your. You time. should ask your teachers what they think about this. I wonder what they would I have. say. I've, oh, yeah, I've what are they saying? 
Well, I've been kind of looking into the book of Enoch and I had a lot of questions and um, my pastor just tells, he told me not to really study the book of Enoch. Oh yeah. Well, it's something interesting. I mean, and, and it's hard to read because it's so long. I, I see these books and it's like, they're so long. I don't want to read all that. So the easiest way to do that is to go on YouTube, get the book of Enoch on, on the thing. And there's a guy, his name is Apocryphal, Apocryphile, I think is his name. And he will just read it and just put the book up there and just scroll along and let you read as he reads. And I just put it in my car. I put my phone in my car when I'm driving somewhere and just let him read driving because I don't have time to read that big. It's a big book. Honestly, there's four volumes, Enoch 1, Enoch 2, Enoch 3, and Enoch 4. It's four huge books. It's huge on its own, but the other four, three, I mean, I wouldn't even go there with the other three. It's just too big, and it's, it's, it's unusual, but Enoch 1, for sure, has a lot of messianic doctrine there. And I know people who use it for doctrine. So, um, but it's, um, the problem for Trinitarians mainly is, is that it doesn't teach the Trinity. It's a main thing. It shows that Jesus is a different person, that he's the servant, he's the representative, but he's not God. And it shows that. God is used for Jesus. You can't deny that either but it means in a different sense um, or because he's the representative that can't be denied as well, but it shows a different aspect of who Christ is as opposed to um, what Trinitarians are showing. And the doctrine of the Trinity absolutely is not found in the Bible. So these old Jewish understandings, you're not finding the doctrine of the Trinity and they have to admit that. That's what I was bothered by, I guess, the most, is not finding that doctrine and trying to justify it when I didn't, couldn't find anything to justify it with, and then realizing what I found in the Bible and what I read instead of what people tell me to believe. So it's interesting. I, I hope you do ask your, your teachers this, and um, because it's unusual. It's not normal, and it it shows that you're studying and they're going to be like, what in the world, Vanessa? <laughs> I don't have time to answer these questions. And it's good. Uh, give them a hard time because it's something they need to answer. And hopefully they can change and, and realize something unusual going on here. And they may ask questions themselves. So Amen. very good. Okay. Well, I'm going to let you go then. I hope you guys have a good, a good week. Um, and we'll do this again next Sunday. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time. Yeah. You guys have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.